And we are live, everyone. So my name is Jesse. I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And of course, there are no classrooms right now. All of you guys are joining us at home on YouTube. And we are so thrilled you continue to join us as we highlight amazing scientists, explorers, and facilities from across the globe. Today, we continue and wrap up our epic space day. We've been having amazing people from all over the world today. But we are joined by Dr. Farah Alibay today. She is in Pasadena. California and she gets to work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This is one of the most storied and iconic research facilities in the entire world and she's a systems engineer there which means she gets to work on and touch and maneuver and play with some of the coolest robots and machines ever designed in the history of mankind. She is one of the last people to put her hands on devices that go all the way to Mars and beyond. So I can't think of a cooler job than that. So without further ado, we are gonna dive into this awesome presentation. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Alibay, and take us away. Yeah, thank you for having me, and thank you for the intro. So yeah, my name is Farah, and I, um, I've been working at JPL for now six and a half years. It seems to go really fast. Um, and so the, my passion is sort of in, in robotic exploration of the solar system as a whole. I love the entire solar system, and, but funnily enough for the past five or so years, I've mostly worked on Mars missions. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking to you about a couple of those missions and just talk about Mars in general, why we go there, what's so cool about Mars um, and what we've done there already also. Um, so I'm a, a systems engineer at JPL uh, and mostly what I work on is, well, I work on all phases of the mission. So I'll work on designing missions, building them, testing them, and then once they, get on that way to Mars and on the surface of Mars, I've also worked on operating missions, um, which is like the coolest thing when you, when, the, when your job is to talk to a robot on Mars every day. I don't, I don't really know, like sometimes it's so surreal because you forget that you're talking to something that's on another planet. Um, so all in all, super fun. Um, that's something that I would recommend for anyone, you know, that's thinking about future careers is if you pick a job that you enjoy doing and that you just, think is really cool no matter what it is it makes it a lot more fun to get paid to do things you like doing um, rather than you know rather than anything else so I always tell people follow your passion I definitely have found mine through this job and it's it's been pretty awesome okay so a quick history of um of Mars mission so we've actually as as a, a society of humanity we've had um a a robot on the surface of Mars every day operating since 2003. That means that for any of you that are what, like 17 or younger, um, it there has been a rover or a, any form of a robot on the surface of Mars for like for as long as you've been alive. And um, that's pretty incredible because uh, the history of Mars exploration before that was actually pretty limited. We went uh, to Mars in the 70s, and then sort of stopped going until the mid 90s. Um, and the first rover that we had was Sojourner, and and that was that was in the mid 90s. It was a tiny tech demo, but the first real rover that we had for science was actually Spirit and Opportunity that landed back in 2003. Um, so the history of rovers is actually fairly recent, but it's evolved very quickly. Um, in addition to the surface missions, which is mostly what I'll talk about today, we also have a lot of orbiters around Mars. So those are spacecraft that are still in space and they're orbiting around Mars, um, which means that they, they study the atmosphere, they provide communication relays, they image the surface of Mars. There was one time, at, a, at one time maybe 10 years ago, before we added some Earth missions, that we understood, for example, the gravity field of Mars better than we did of Earth, just because of one of the instruments that we had up there. Now we have the GRACE and GRACE follow-on missions that look at the gravity field on Earth and look at uh, the water moving. But for a split second there, there was one part of Mars that we understood better than Earth. And that's pretty incredible. Um, but in terms of surface missions, like I said, um, Spirit and Opportunity were twin rovers that landed back in 2003. Um, they were smaller rovers of the few hundred pounds kind of size um, that studied that mostly did geology. And then we had the Curiosity rover that landed in 2012. 
Um, and I was actually an intern when the Curiosity rover landed. So that's kind of the start of my career. And I actually have a picture for you to show you at the end of uh, my little like eight year throwback of, of what it was like back then. And, um, and then since then we've uh, last, so a year and a half ago on uh, the American Thanksgiving of 2018, time goes really fast, we landed the InSight rover, uh, which is a mission, a lander, sorry, does not move, um, which is a mission that I worked on and I'll talk to you about a little bit. And then upcoming very soon, actually launches in 100 days, uh, we're launching the Perseverance rover, which is formerly called uh, Mars 2020. We finally got a name for it and there was a whole competition. It's called Perseverance. Um, so that's launching in, on, in July of 2020 and it'll be landing in February of 2021. Um, there's also a Chinese mission that's due to, um, to launch around that timeline too. Um, so it'll be pretty neat to hopefully have other countries join us on the surface of Mars uh, very soon. Um, and that's really exciting. So let me start with Insight and give you a little bit of background. So I worked on Insight for a couple of years. I worked on both the development and um, the operations of that lander. So it's a lander. You can see it's got legs, it's not moving. A lot easier, as it turns out. I'm now learning and now work on the, built, figuring out how we're going to drive the next rover. Um, so it's a lander, it has solar arrays, maybe like um, what you, you might have on your house to get power. And um, it also had a robotic arm that was used to, once we, when we landed on the surface, the instruments were on the deck of the lander. And if you've ever played the claw game at the arcade, um, it's kind of a, we played a similar game on Mars where we picked up the instruments from the deck of the rover and put them on the surface of Mars. And what INSIGHT did and is still doing is it's studying the interior of Mars. Um, a lot of our rovers study chemistry and geology and take a lot of images. Insight, INSIGHT's job is to actually study the planet as a whole and its inside. And we have a seismometer that is essentially looking for earthquakes on Mars. We call them Marsquakes. Um, and it's been listening for these Marsquakes for about a year now um, since we have commissioned and, and gotten on the surface of Mars. And that tells us things about the core of Mars, the thickness of the mantle. If any of you have studied, you know, in school, you'll have studied that Earth has a crust and it has a mantle and it has an outer core and an inner core. And we have plate tectonics on Earth. And that's why we have things like earthquakes, especially here in California. That's also why we have volcanoes and mountains is because those tectonic plates are moving. Mars is really different. It has a single crust, so a single plate. Um, and yet it has some of the biggest features that we've seen in the solar system. It has the biggest volcano we've ever seen in the solar system. It is bigger than Mount Everest, which is insane if you think about it. Uh, it's not active anymore, otherwise that would be crazy. Um, but, uh, but in terms of size, right, you can imagine a dead volcano that's bigger than Mount Everest. And there's also a, a uh, trench, Mount Maneris, that goes from... If it was on Earth, the size of it would go from New York to LA, and it would be three times as deep as uh, the Grand Canyon, if any of you have been there, uh, which is just, in the, I can't even imagine how big that would be, how big that feature would be. But then Mars is also a third of the size of the Earth, so that's a huge feature. Um, so Mars clearly has uh, different mechanisms that, than we do on Earth for the production, for those features to be created, and Insight is trying to unlock some of those secrets. Um, and so we're trying, we're starting to get the initial results from that mission. Um, there are a few papers out there that talk about um, the initial estimates for what the soul might be made of and what, how thick it might be and what those mechanisms might be, uh, which is really cool for me as an engineer. You know, I, of course, I understand what the scientists do, but, um, but I don't do the science myself. I provide the science tools, if you if you think of it that way, for the scientists to do that job. So think of it as, you know, if you ever play with a chemistry kit and you're doing chemistry, the engineer, my job is to put that chemistry kit together and get it to you or get it to the place where you need it to be. Um, and then I get to hear back about the cool things that the scientists do with uh, with those, those tools that we're providing them. Um, one of the really neat things with the InSight mission is that it was launched out of California. Typically, uh, we launch all of our spacecraft out of Florida. 
um, because we want them to launch over the ocean always, so we can either launch over the Pacific or the Atlantic. There are advantages to launching over the Atlantic, and that's because we launch in the same direction as the rotation of the Earth, and that gives us a little boost because we're already rotating. We, we get that speed for free, basically. So, you know, you might not realize at any moment that you're moving, but you're actually moving in the direction of the rotation of the Earth at any point, um, which means that, you know, if you were to launch outside of the Earth and leave the Earth, if you launch in the direction that you're already moving, that helps you rather than if you have to launch the other way. With InSight, because it was such a small spacecraft, we were able to launch it the other way over uh, the Pacific out of, um, out of Vandenberg, which is just north of Los Angeles here, which is where I'm based. Um, I was actually a mile and a half away from where, the ro where we launched, where the rocket launched from, and I didn't see a thing because we launched in May of, 20, um, of 2018. And if any of you are from California, you know that um, in May and June, we get the marine layer coming in the morning and you get really, really thick fog. People who are not from here often think that it's pollution, but no, it's fog that's coming in from, from the ocean. And so we couldn't, I could feel it. My whole chest was vibrating, but I never actually saw the launch. And I had friends up here, down here in LA who, um, went up in the mountains and were able to see them, um, which is pretty cool. Um, but if you're based in California, um, especially out of LA or Northern California, if you know where to look, um, you can actually see launches uh, from here. Obviously, the best place to see them is, is out in Florida, um, but I've definitely seen launches uh, from the heavier rockets just out of, out of my window at work, which is pretty incredible. Um, and in terms of my job, a lot of people often ask me, well, what is it that you do every day? Or like, what do you look like? Uh, you know, what, what they want to picture themselves in terms of like, what is it that an engineer do, does? And it's often really hard for me to answer that question because my job on a day-to-day -day changes. Now, I'm not going to lie, I do spend a lot of time in front of my computer, um, a lot of time coding or pre preparing presentations or, or you know, putting, doing a lot of math, actually. Um, but sometimes I get to do cool things. So uh, I've got a few pictures out here. So the one on the, on the left for you is uh, a picture of me in the clean room when we were building Insight. So you can actually see Insight behind here. Um, that is actually the, the lander that went to Mars, um, which is super cool. Um, and so I got to, we wear these, what we call bunny suits. Uh, which are these white suits, so you can't tell, but this is me in the white on the right-hand side. Um, and those are used so that we can keep the landers clean um, because if you get any dust or any particles on your cameras, for example, you know, on your phone, you can just, I just wipe it off on my shirt and move on, right? But if you're going to Mars and there's dirt on your camera, you there's no one that's going to come out to clean it for you. There's, um, and, you know, there's no... I always say there's no AAA on Mars, and so if you need to repair anything, it's not going to happen. So we try and keep everything clean, as clean as possible, um, so that we don't share those particulates or whatever it is that's on us. Because humans are very dirty. We don't want to get that on the lander. Um, one of the other neat things I got to do is I got to support some of the pre-launch activities. So you can see the rocket right here behind me on this picture. And way up there was Insight. I got to test out, do some of the final tests that we do on the lander before it goes. Um, and then for almost a year, I also worked on operations for the lander. So as I mentioned before, things like talking to it on its way to Mars, doing all the checkouts on the instruments. And then when we got on the surface of Mars, I was part of the team that was operating the rover, the lander, sorry, day to day. Um, and the way that works, one of the things that's really interesting with Mars is that um, it, the daytime, the days there are 24 and a half hours long. So that means that for Mars to do a full rotation, it takes 24 and a half hours. So, and what we do is that we, the lander does work during the day. We can't operate it in real time. It's not like a video game or joystick because there's a delay. It takes radio signals or light, which is all, all the same types of signal. It takes 7 to 12 minutes to get to Mars and then 7 to 12 minutes to get back. So we don't just sit there, send a command, and then wait for it to get back. That would be atrociously long. Um, but what we do is we work during the Martian night, 
and prepare everything that the lander has to do the next day. And then in the morning, it wakes up. It literally sleeps at night. And then it wakes up, gets all the information that we told them to do. So it's like, think of it as like a to-do list. Um, it does that during the day. And then at night, it sends us back data and pictures and says, says, hey, I did all of this today. Look at what I did. I'm going to go to sleep now. I'll talk to you in the morning. Like, let me know what you need to do tomorrow. And then we work through the night, uh, which is fine, right? A lot of people work at night. The problem is because the Martian day is not quite the same as an Earth day, our start time actually moves by a half hour every day, uh, which means that some days we're starting, you know, at a reasonable time, maybe at 9 a.m. because we're completely opposite to where Mars is. But then think of it as like if one day you had to go in at 9 and then you're going in at 9.30 and then at 10 and at 10.30 and it slowly shifts so that, you know, maybe two weeks from now you're starting at 7 p.m. And it's like when you want to make plans with your friends, that's pretty hard um, to be planning that way. Uh, but that's just what we have to do um, if we want to work with our spacecraft on Mars. And so I left the InSight mission um, almost a year almost a year ago now, um, once we were done with sort of the initial deployment and commissioning, and really now it's mostly the scientists that are uh, that have taken over. And I joined the Mars 2020 mission, which is, I forgot to update this with the new name, but which is, um, we're building the Perseverance rover. And so there's an image of it here. And Perseverance is the most complex rover we have ever built. Um, if you're familiar with the Curiosity rover, it's kind of like, it's hard to say. I'm like, I always say it's this little sister, but she's kind of like bigger and better equipped, which I guess like my little brother is like six foot four and I'm five eight. So I always think of like the little sibling as actually being bigger. Um, so think of it as like the littler, the newer, but cooler version of Curiosity. Uh, it's gotten some major upgrades. We have new wheels. Um, and we have a whole new set of instruments in here um, that are going to help us to study the surface of Mars. Um, I think we have something like 28 cameras, uh, which is insane. I always thought, you know, the new iPhones have like, what, four cameras? This is this is beyond. Um, but we'll be able to take all sorts of amazing pictures of Mars. Um, but what Mars 2020 is doing is that it's actually, um, so it's gonna, it's going to also tra uh, travel on Mars much faster than we have before, um, but it's going to collect samples at different places on Mars. And it's going to put those samples in a caching system uh, where we're gonna both analyze those samples and then put them in tubes and seal them away. Because the goal is that if Mars 2020 is successful, that one day we might be able to return those samples back to Earth. So think of it this way, when we go to Mars, we bring essentially what's a chemistry kit with us, right? We bring a set of instruments with us, um, to study Mars the way we think it might be. And every time we go, we get surprised and we learn new things that we weren't expecting. And maybe sometimes we don't have the right tools with us um, because we brought what we thought we would need um, and then left something back home, right? And it's not like it's not like when you go camping here where like, okay, you forgot something, you can go back next time or you can go back home and pick it up. This is like, we've gone to Mars, it took us six, six months to get there and landing on Mars is one of the hardest things humans can do. Um, you're not getting that extra instrument. Um, so being able to bring those samples back home would allow us to do a lot more uh, investigation on what's going on Mars and have all of these possible instruments available to us. And we'd be able to share this across you know, global community, which is pretty incredible. So you know, no small goals for Mars 2020. Um, in terms of a timeline, like I said, we're actually just finishing up the build. Um, if you look on uh, mars.nasa.gov, um, you can find sort of the latest updates on on Perseverance, but uh, we actually just fitted it with it. We the rover had wheels that we did all our testing wheel with, and then we kind of changed out the wheels and gave it some fresh rims before it goes to Mars. So we just put that in. Uh, we're finishing up some of the final testing. It's actually all sewed up and in its its launch configuration. Um, so we're finishing up to the all of the last minute sort of testing this month. Uh, we'll be rolling out the pad and then uh, launch will happen in July of, uh, I think it's July 17th or 18th of 2020. That's when the, the launch period opens. Uh, it takes us about seven months to get to Mars. So we'll be traveling sort of in a capsule um, on our way to Mars. And we'll be talking to 
pretty much every day on its way there. And then in February of 2021, uh, we'll be landing on Mars. And so that will happen. That will happen sort of like in, during the daytime. Um, I think that the, the exact time is actually already set um, because no matter when we launch, we land on the same day. Um, and as soon as we land, uh, we will be starting operations. And I'm actually part of the team that will be also operating the rover this time. And I sort of, let me show you this video of it being built and I'll, I'll talk about it at the same time. Um, but uh, so this video will just show, walk you through sort of the different stages. For example, this is the descent stage and the crew stage that the rover will be in. So that's kind of the house that the rover will be in um, this whole time. Um, and you'll see a little bit of, of JPL and of, of us building the rover. Um, my job as uh, an engineer on Mars 2020 is a little bit different from what I did on InSight. On InSight, I, I worked mostly on the instruments and with the science team. On Mars 2020, as I mentioned, I actually work on the driving system. And so uh, for me, that was something completely different because InSight was a lander, didn't go anywhere. Um, and on Mars 2020, we have to drive, we have to figure out where we are all the time, which is kind of crazy to think about, right? On Earth, I mean, I'm useless at directions, but I always, always have GPS, right? And I do a lot of, of backcountry climbing and hiking, um, but I can plan everything. I have a map ahead of time, but I always have my compass and a GPS um, to, to help me guide myself on, uh, you know, on Earth. On Mars, it's a little different. GPS, you know, if, if you think about where GPS comes from, it's satellites that we have around Earth that tells us where we are at any given time. We don't have GPS on Mars. We also don't have a global magnetic field on Mars, which means that if you brought your compass to Mars, that would not work either. Um, there is no way of knowing where North is using a compass on Mars. So, um, so we have different ways of doing that. One of the primary ways that we know where we're going on Mars actually is by looking at the sun. Um, and if any of you have done scouts or you know, I've done any sort of backcountry navigating, you know that you can look at the sun to figure out which direction it is. Depending on what time of day it is and what time of year it is, you know that if the sun is above you, it's either 12 or one o'clock. And when it's pointing west or east, it's either the evening or the morning. Uh, but if you're able to calculate the exact angle that it's at, and I, I often was taught the trick of like how many fingers are there um, between sun and, and the horizon, and that tells you when the sun's going to set, for example. Um, so, but if there's actually mass behind that, and if you know exactly where the sun is, you can actually tell um, where, what direction you're pointed in. So that's one of the main ways that we navigate on Mars, which I thought was really cool. Um, essentially, we use the biggest star that there is. Um, and we also use accelerometers the same way as you might have on a phone. If accelerometers, that's how you know, for example, when you do use maps, which direction you're pointing in, we use the same thing on the rover to figure out which direction you're pointing in and where we're going. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the ways that we test that uh, is a picture here of us in uh, what we have, we have essentially an outdoor Mars yard. So, so part of the testing that I do, uh, which is really neat, I get to tell people this, is that I basically work in a, in a giant yard, a giant sand bucket um, up um, at JPL, up the hill from us. And so we will, what we do there is, um, so what you're seeing there is that what we call Scarecrow, it's a it's a pared down version of the rover that mostly has the wheel and now the, the wheels and now the brains that the rover has. And we can test out driving on different terrains. So you can see here it's driving over some rocks. This is a pretty flat terrain. Um, and we're testing things like autonomous navigation where it, it, the, the rover can self-drive. Um, so we test out some of that self-driving. We send it on different slopes. Uh, we sometimes give it goals and say, hey, go go look at this pile of rocks over there. And it figures out its own way. Um, so actually now starting you know, this summer, I'm going to be spending a lot of my time in the Mars yard testing a lot of the systems that we developed, um, which is cool, right? Like that means that most of my days are going to be spent outside. I may regret not having AC, um, but it's kind of fun to get to be hands-on and, and get to drive robots around for a living. Um, and one of the coolest tests that we did before the rover went away is we did actually do one test with the real rover inside very carefully. Um, and we got to drive it um, 
in our testing facility. So this happened a few days after my birthday back in December. Um, and you can see there's a lot of engineers just looking around, making sure that we're not catching anything, uh, which I always find funny because when we're on Mars, we just tell the rover to go to unexplored terrain and just go over all these rocks. Um, but, you know, the first time that you test this in a controlled environment, we didn't want to break the rover before it went. Um, so that was one of the tests that I got to be involved with. I got to help design uh, what the test was going to be about and um, analyze some of the results. And I wasn't actually on the floor, but I was behind in one of the rooms. You can kind of see, like, my head was, like, somewhere here. I'm, like, next to this person in this picture. Um, so that was one of the funnest, like, most fun tests that I got to participate in before we went, uh, before we uh, left for Mars. Um, so, yeah, and I just wanted to end, I kind of promised this picture, but uh, for me, it's been kind of a, a coming full circle. So often people ask me, you know, how did you start at, at JPL? Like, why, how did you, how do you work at NASA? Um, well, I always, like I said, I always wanted to work on, on robots that went to Mars. I thought that was really cool. Um, and I got to intern at JPL um, back when I was a graduate student. So JPL takes on about five to 600 interns every year. Um, and that means that our population grows by about 10% every year. Uh, and this was me back in 2012, my first internship. Uh, at JPL, it's a little bit younger, um, but behind me, what's really cool is behind me, you get to see this rover right here. That is the Earth replica of um, Curiosity. And so, uh, and you know, back then I just thought it was really cool to see the engineers play around with it in the Mars yard. That's that same yard that I was telling you about. And what's really cool is this summer, I'm hoping I can get the same picture. Right now, this is, this is in our indoors Mars yard on the right. But this summer, I'll be working with the Perseverance version, the Earth version of Perseverance out in the Mars yard also, which is kind of crazy to think, oh, I started off just by being amazed by what these engineers are doing. And now I'm the engineer out in the, in the Mars yard testing this rover that, that is going to land on Mars very soon. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a little bit of an overview of Mars. And then if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Super cool. Thank you so, so much for an awesome presentation and ending with that really cool shot and uh, back to back. And we hope you do get that opportunity to, to go and have that exact same picture. Hopefully we can get the same two people into it too, eight years on. Uh, I don't know if you still know so that. One of them, <laughs> one of them still works at JPL. So, um, so I, I can at least get him. The other, I guess we'll have to fly her in to do it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. If you want to come out of screen share so we can see you, that would be great. Um, for everyone tuning yeah. in on YouTube, as many as we can uh, in our time remaining, I want to start with a few. Gold on spacecraft. Every time there's something that's going to Mars or to the moon, it's always got this, like, looks like gold tinfoil. What is the gold tinfoil all about? What's going on? Why? <laughs> so it is, it is actually um, gold. Uh, so it's actually a blanket. Um, so it's a layered blanket, and the gold has these reflective... Um, the uh, properties that uh that we think are really important um so actually yeah so we uh do that to protect the fuel for example and keep things warm so the same way as you'd have a blanket on earth to keep things warm uh we have the same on uh yeah on other spacecraft very cool all right um you said something in your presentation which i've never heard before in any of our presentations so you said, regardless of which day we send off this, this rocket from Earth, it will land on the same day on Mars. How is that possible? Do tell. <laughs> um, okay, so basically what we do is that there is an optimal transfer trajectory between Earth and Mars. So, and that's called a Hohmann transfer, um, but it's essentially a half ellipse. So think of it as we want to launch from Mars here and you know, from Earth here, and we want to get to Mars when it's on the other side of the sun. So we'd have the sun in the middle. I wish I had like a little planet with me, but um, so um, so we do a half ellipse, and that's the that's the the lo the most efficient way to get there. So not the fastest, but the one that uses the least fuel. Um, so we design every mission. Um, so ideally, you there is a one time specific time and day where you would launch a mission and that would get you to Mars using the least fuel. 
And but the problem is, what if it's raining that day, or like, what if you have bad weather, or what if like, I don't know, there's something wrong with your spacecraft. You don't want to rely on just being able to launch on that one day. So what we do is we create a launch period by adding a little bit. Well, actually, what we do is we make the spacecraft a little bit smaller than what the rocket is able to do, so that we have a little bit of spare fuel, and then. We either catch up to that traject that perfect trajectory, or we slow down to get to that perfect trajectory, depending on whether we've launched early or late. Um, so within, you know, the first, the first few, even at the, it's actually it happens at the launch how much we burn. Uh, we end up on that particular trajectory. So for every possible like minute that we launch on in that four week launch window, uh, we have a unique solution that gets us to that trajectory uh, and it gets us to land on Mars on the same date and time. I think to be precise that the landing time changes by like 15 minutes, um, depending on where you launch, but like it's pretty much on point, which is really cool. It is remarkable to think that, you know, we figured that out with the engineering and math to know that we can get it within a 15 minute window is a, you know, a very small period of time or yeah. like a seven month <laughs> launch schedule. Very cool. I'd never heard that before. All right. So obviously you are in love with Mars. Is there another planet or moon or place in our solar system you'd most like to send other things to explore? Personally. Uh, absolutely. Um, so personally, one of the things that I found really fascinating is the possibility that there could be life somewhere else in our solar system. It's actually one of the goals um, of NASA is to figure out, hey, could there be life anywhere else, even if it's just microbial life or, you know, little microorganisms, because that has such huge implications in terms of understanding where we come from and, and where we've been. And, and really what it comes down to is if there's life anywhere else in the solar system that tells you um, that there could be life anywhere in the universe and that we're not alone. Um, so in terms of the best targets for finding life in the solar system, Mars is one of them. Obviously, we think that Mars back in the day could have looked like Earth, and so we could find evidence of extant life. We know that there is an ongoing life most likely on Mars right now, um, but the best target for finding life right now is um, icy moons. So we have moons in our solar system that have oceans and they have um, often ice shells and the coolest icy moon, in my opinion, my favorite moon is Enceladus, which is the moon of Saturn. Um, and Enceladus, Enceladus's ocean is bigger than the Earth's ocean. So it has a ton of water and it has a core that's solid. So that means that there can be um, exchange between the core and the ocean and then a really thick ice shell. But now the coolest part is that the poles of Enceladus and the southern pole there's these massive geysers. We call them jets because they're not hot geysers the way you would have on Earth. They're basically like breaks in the ice where the, where the water comes out and is just spewing out into the solar system. So in terms of a mission that would go there, I think it would be really cool to fly a spacecraft through those geysers. And, and Cassini did that, um, which is a, a spacecraft that was in orbit around Saturn, but it didn't have the right instruments because Cassini discovered those geysers and didn't know they were going to be there. So it didn't have the right science kit. Um, so I think it'd be really cool to go back there with the right science kit and look at what's in that water because um, if there's if there's life in the solar system, that might be where we find it. You are breaking with so much tradition with other NASA folks. Everyone's a Europa person except you. You're the first Enceladus. Oh no, I'm an Enceladus person. <laughs> Europa's cool. cool too, but I think I think if you look at pictures of Enceladus, it is so beautiful. It's such a beautiful moon. So. Super cool. Well, so I, I'm guessing that the answer to this question is yes, but we've asked this of every space person today. What do you think of the prospect of life in the universe generally, um, and even intelligent life in the universe personally? Like, what are your thoughts? Is it out there? What do you think? Are we going to find I it? I really hope it's out there. I, I feel like it has to be. There's, I, I, you know, as much as we like to think that we're unique and different, I really hope we're not. Like, I hope there is life out there. Now, whether we will find it in our, um, in our lifetime, that I'm not sure of, right? Because there are limitations in terms of how fast we can travel or even how fast we can communicate. I think that's why we mostly focus on at looking for life within the solar system. And we're pretty sure there's no intelligent life in the solar system, or at least intelligent the way, you know, at all level. Um, but, you know, when it comes to the broader universe, I, I have a really, really hard time believing that we would be alone in this gigantic world right and, and so even if humans were created by luck of a certain chemical reaction happening for life to start 
um, the universe is so huge, it has to at least have happened somewhere else. Right? Yeah, we had someone on the other day share a picture of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And if people haven't seen that at home, check out Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's just this tiny, tiny bit of sky uh, that they pointed a telescope at and it captured thousands of galaxies, like thousands upon thousands of not just one star, but like hundreds of millions of stars. And so one of the classic things is it would be an awful waste of space if there were no other life out there. Um, Vera, <laughs> let's take two more before we wrap up. A question we've always gotten, what is your favorite part of your job, if anything? Oh, <laughs> no pressure. I mean, I think I've already said, like, I get to talk to robots on other planets, but, um, that it, works. but I think in general, <laughs> it's, I love the concept that like we were explorers, right? And it's like true exploration, which is kind of crazy to think about of like, you know, back in the day when people were exploring Earth or still when people now are exploring oceans or, or remote places, I get to be an explorer, but in our solar system and in the comfort of my own home most days. Um, but it's pretty incredible, you know, when you land on Mars and, and we'll see this, especially with Perseverance, when Perseverance will drive, you know, every so often and, and maybe a couple of times a week, we'll get to a new place on Mars that no one's ever seen before. And I get to be one of the people, the first people that sees those pictures, like with my own eyes, I get to be one of the first humans who sees new places on Mars, discovers new things. And that that's kind of an incredible feeling if you think about it. So. I bet. Uh, it's been such a fun space day. Sorry, this has been thrilling for me too. And I'm sure for everyone at home, uh, it's been so much fun hearing from, from people like you. This is so great. Um, all right. We're at the end of our session, so I want to make sure that we can keep the learning going for people at home. Uh, what are some resources we can send people to to learn more about you, about the work of NASA JPL, about these new, you know, the Perseverance mission and more? Where can we guide people? So the, the best resource is to go to mars.jpl.nasa.gov. Um, uh, sorry, mars.nasa.gov. Um, that will lead you to all of the Mars missions out there. It will also link to all of our social media channels. Um, and so that, that's definitely the best way to, to get started on learning more about our Mars missions. That's also where we post all of our updates. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of them in the upcoming few but. Yeah. And then for you personally, you have a Twitter account and an Instagram account. Can you share where those are? I use uh, I use Instagram, and my Instagram and the handle is at Trifaratops. Um, so T R I F A R A H T O P S. In another life, I also wanted to study dinosaurs, <laughs> hence the the name. Uh, so that's one way to find me, or on Twitter. Um, it's at Farah Alibe, so that's just my first name and my last name. Um, I don't use Twitter as much, but you can definitely contact me that way if you have questions. Fantastic. Eric, thank you so, so much for joining us today. We so appreciate it. Um, and uh, your enthusiasm is infectious. We're all going to go out and check out all sorts of neat stuff about Mars right away. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Awesome. For everyone tuning in at home, thank you so much. Again, in April, we're going to be doing over 100 live free programs, no registration required. So come in uh, and learn about whatever you're interested in. We probably have someone on talking about it. We really appreciate you joining and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye for now, everyone.